Okay, so before we do, or before we go into details, write stuff on the whiteboard and so on, let's just talk about these problems in generality, sort of. Um, so in number one, what would be a method for taking this integral? You substitution. I hear you substitution and I agree. Like if you let u be the sine of x and du be the cosine of x dx. This is a product, but it's not a good candidate for integration by parts because nothing gets simpler when you take its derivative. You use integration by parts when taking derivative will simplify one of the factors, or at least that's the general rule. What about number two? That also be u substitution. I hear u substitution a second time, and I agree. Um, we have composition which is a good sign that you should try U substitution. I mean, it's not 100%. Um, all of the, the, oh, what's it called? The trigonometric substitutions, those are also compositions. Um, and here, this is U substitution, even though this isn't the composition. But when you see compositions, it's good to at least think. If you let u be the cosine of x, then du isn't quite the sine of x, it's negative the sine of x. But we've seen how we can deal with missing negatives before. What about three? parts on that one. I'm hearing parts in a slightly skeptical tone, but that's correct. So what are the sort of signs here that would make me think of parts? Like I looked at this for the first time in a year. I certainly didn't remember, you know, the answer key. So how do I know this is parts? Well, you've got a product, first of all, x times e to the x. And both the things you are multiplying are pretty special. x becomes nicer when you take its derivative. The derivative of x is 1. e to the x doesn't become any worse when you integrate it. The integral of e to the x is still just e to the x. And in general, for parts, that's what you're looking for. Something that's going to become nicer times something that at least isn't going to become worse. So, I mean, you can do kind of tricksy problems, you know, the natural log and the arc tangent and that e to the x times the sine of x. But the vast majority of cases where you use parts is a polynomial times e to the x or a polynomial times a trig function because polynomials are the main function that get nicer when you differentiate them. All right, so fours, a definite integral, but in four at least, that shouldn't be an issue if we can integrate this, we can plug in 0 and 1. So how do we integrate 1 over x minus 2? Thank you. 
doing your substitution there as well. You can do you substitution. I mean, this is, it's always hard to know, or, you know, the difference between confusion and just being embarrassed to talk. But integrals like this showed up a lot in the partial fraction decomposition, remember? So we should be able to take them. And if you let u be x minus 2, this ends up being a natural logarithm. So what's the difference between 4 and 5? Someone who hasn't answered a question yet, maybe. Well, 5 is undefined and 2. You're, yes, you're correct. Four is a proper integral. We can just use um, the fundamental theorem, no issue. Five is an improper integral. It has a vertical asymptote at one of its endpoints. So you have to take rewrite this as a limit and deal with it that way. <laughs> All right, what about six? What do you figure for six in terms of, of strategy? If you do trig substitution. Um, so half of that's right. The trig substitution, when you like X, let x be the sign of theta or whatever. That's something you do when you have special square roots. Oh, so, yeah. But what we do have is we have a power of sine times a power of cosine. So what, uh, jog memories, if I explicitly mention that we've got an odd power of sine times the power of the cosine. Yeah. So this is, I'm hearing it. Okay, we really do have a lot to go through. So I'll just sort of, what section would this be? Section 8.3 is what I want to say. But when you have odd powers of a sine or a cosine multiplied by other powers of sine or cosine, there's a standard trick we use. We pull one of the sines out. <clears throat> so we have the sine squared times the sine times the cosine squared then we use the Pythagorean identity to turn the sine squared into cosines. Then we do a U substitution. So at this point we've seen, are there any, at this point we've seen all of the techniques we're going to use on the in-class portion of the test. Stuff like um, the aforementioned trigonometric substitutions are very fiddly and time-consuming. Um, <coughs> partial fractions is I guess not usually so bad, but I mean you have to, you know, recognize, you know, if you can factor a polynomial, and especially if it's, you know, a third degree or higher polynomial, that might be a lot of work. So um, the numerical stuff, the Simpsons rule and all of that, again, it's not that it's hard, it's just that in a timed environment, you know, writing down, and things you're adding and then actually adding them on your calculator can be pretty time consuming. So be that 
as it may, we won't stop here. What's a good method for seven? Would that be part? That is part. Thank you very much. So what I was saying earlier, that you want something that becomes nicer when you take its derivative versus something that at least doesn't become worse when you integrate it. <laughs> That's the, <laughs> uh, sorry. That's the general guideline for parts. So specifically, we should consider that in X be a U, and the cosine of x dx be a d of v. Now, 7 and 8 obviously were written to look kind of similar, but they're different techniques. How should we approach 8? Uh, can you do u substitution on that? You can do u substitution. We've got composition. And the classic thing to try is to let u be the inside function of composition. And that does work here. I mean, du equals 2x. Again, we're missing a 2, but I hope that's pretty, um, pretty second nature by now. Um, <clears throat> yeah, sorry. So if you tried Parts. I mean, there's nothing wrong with trying, but at some point you'll hopefully realize that it doesn't work. And particular, what's going to happen is you'll that u be x, you'll be that d v be the cosine of x squared, and then you won't be able to find v because you won't be able to integrate the cosine of x squared. <laughs> and a lot of time when I'm looking at tests and I'm seeing students who struggle, the reason they're struggling or a reason they're struggling is that they'll try something and it doesn't work, but, but they just keep going. They, they won't um, sort of admit that it's not working and try something else. And I do understand, you know, tests are a stressful environment. They're a timed environment. You don't want to spend five minutes doing something and then just have that not count for anything. But there are elements of trial and error in the calculus. <laughs> Seeing a product and trying parts isn't, you know, a sign that you're a bad student or that you don't understand the material. You just need to be willing to recognize when it's not doing what you want it to. Nine. Nine is, I don't think I was trying to be tricksy here, but nine maybe could trick people. Um, what's a good way to approach nine? Yeah, looks like you substitution. So didn't fool anyone in the classroom, at least. Again, it wasn't really meant to fool people. But I was just looking at nine and thinking this could be confusing because this, um, this is a rational function. And we do have a specialized technique for rational functions, which is... Um, partial fraction decomposition. That can't work here because x squared plus one doesn't factor. And to use partial fraction decomposition on a quadratic down here, you need to be able to factor the quadratic. What I heard instead was correct. Um, 
if you let u be x squared plus one, then du, uh, it's not selecting quite what I want it to, but du will be two x dx. And you'll have one over u, and the integral of one over u is what? The natural, the natural log. So you'll wind up with a natural log here, a natural log of an absolute value, I should say. So 10, I mean, in general, you know, what's going on in 10 is clear enough. If, if this PDF would let me highlight the integral sign, which it won't, we've got an improper integral from A to infinity here. So we have to turn this into a limit. We also have to actually take the integral of e to the x, of course. Um, how can we do that? Does it just stay the same even though it's to the negative x? Not quite. Oh, um, you work it. I think we did this one. So when you have e, I mean, e to a power, right? Okay, I guess I haven't had any examples like this so far. But something like e to the negative x or e to the 3x are very important integrals because they show up a lot in differential equations. <laughs> And the trick is to think of this as a U substitution. So we've got an outside function, which is this exponential function. And we've got an inside function, which is negative X. I think that sometimes um, students struggle with this because we're so used to um, inside functions having literal parentheses. It's like, if instead of writing e to the negative x, we use this sort of computer science notation, x to the, um, and then negative x in parentheses, it would probably be a lot more obvious to a lot more students that we want to compose with an inside and an outside function. Um, unfortunately, this notation doesn't tend to get used out of like computer languages where it's difficult to have superscripts, but, but this is U substitution. Eleven, I was sort of running out of ideas, maybe. Um, so how do you integrate 11? No, just the tangent. Just, just the tangent. I always get at least one student who sees this and thinks, okay, we have a trig power squared, time to do something clever. Um, but the derivative of the tangent is the secant squared. So the antiderivative of the secant squared is the tangent. 12 is a little more intricate. How can we work with 12? Is it U substitution? Again? It is U substitution. What should we let U be? Um, secant squared. So I, th there are actually two answers to this question. And I liked, um, until you said the square, oh. you were sort of, 
but but this is just one of those things where it's perfectly fine to try and as long as you don't you know get obsessed with it and keep trying after it doesn't work so it's perfectly fine to try this the issue is that you're going to wind up with du is 2 times the secant of x to the first and then the chain rule is going to give you the derivative of the secant which is the secant times the tangent. And then you, you look at this integral and here's what you need to finish the substitution. And here's what we actually have, just the tangent. So this seems to be a dead end. Any other thoughts? Then you could just make it tangent, right? Tangent is a good choice. If we let you be the tangent, then the du is right there, and this problem passes through. Um, I don't don't want to risk overcomplicating things, but when you said secant, it did make me realize that there's another way of doing this problem. This is the tangent times the secant times the secant. If you let u just be the secant, du is the secant times the tangent, which is what we have. But certainly when I was writing the problem, I imagined that we'd be doing it in the first way, on, on the left-hand side of the board. Uh, 13, thoughts on this? So I feel, I don't know, I mean, maybe I just shouldn't have these problems because I don't like them either. Um, so we, in chapter seven, we look at some integrals involving the inverse trig functions. And they're messy integrals, and you learn them as long as you need to for the test, and then probably forget them. That's not a judgment statement. It's exactly what I did as a student. But um, but since this is kind of a the integration test, it, it would feel a little weird not to have those integrals on it. This is an arc tangent. This is... Do you factor out one fourth and then put the arc tangent underneath? That's, that factoring out a fourth is exactly correct. You.
down here for then that four is a constant, it pulls out. And the x, one plus x squared is, um, or I should say one over one plus x squared is the derivative of the arc tangent. So this ends up being one fourth times the arc tangent. And I do, I probably that you bring in a note card on the first test. Is that true? Yeah. So we can we can do it again on the second test. Um and maybe maybe those integrals are good candidates for a note card. But um See, am I sharing this? I think I am. So what about 14? Would you start by making a 2x minus 6 to the 1 half power? That's a good place to start. What, uh, what now? Since it's subtraction, you can just put that for both of the terms, right? Since it's not multiplying, you could go like 2x to the 1 half minus 6 to the 1 half. Um, so the... Pro the um, the issue you're going to have there is, I mean, just like when you're squaring, oh. you don't just square the A and the B, you have to foil it out. Yeah. Um, the one half power isn't going to be that. Um, you can't rewrite the square root of a difference as the difference of the square oh. root. Can you do you substitution? You substitution. I, th I think people are maybe seeing the square root and somehow over complicating things a little. Now it's true that we don't have a two, but this is an old trick by now. And we end up on another uh, fundamental theorem problem. I mean, take using the fundamental theorem is maybe sort of the point of all of this, but, you know, sometimes just taking the integral is so much work. Um, so how do we, um, how do we integrate this? As a matter of fact, we already did integrate this, I think think it showed up without um, without the limits of integration, unless I'm just totally, no, it was x times the cosine of x squared. But if the trick is going to be the same, u substitution, let u be x squared, du is well, 2x dx, but we put in a 2, we put in a 1 half. 
Are there any of these now that we've sort of talked about, because, you know, getting them started is more than half the battle. It's like 90% of the battle. And if you, you know, if you know what you're doing, but you, but you forget to put the one half in here or whatever, it's, you know, it's not the hugest deal. You would get partial credit. So I wanted to make sure we talked about that, especially because, I mean, I've tried not to do this, but in calculus, it's very easy for a professor to just fall into the, well, we know what technique we need to use because it's the technique we just taught trap which is not very helpful to students when they're taking the test and trying to decide what to do. Um, so are there any of these problems that you'd like to see done in more detail? Did you do number six, the powers of trig function? Yeah, absolutely. So sine cubed, cosine squared. So the trick for using or for integrating products that look like this, um, well, I guess I should say, first of all, that if we have a product like this and we don't, and we just have one of the trig functions, then that would, would be something totally different. Here, you could just let you, I guess not totally different, but you could just let u be the cosine of x, du be negative the sine of x, and proceed. So when we're talking about these odd powers, what we really mean is odd powers that are greater than one. And the trick for rod powers is to pull one of how there's I don't know any really good way of writing this in English. Pull one of the odd trig functions out. If there are two odd powers, we can choose which one we want to work with. Always work with the smallest power if you have a choice. But here there is no choice because only one of them is odd. That's going to leave us with an even power. So the second thing, the second step, we don't really have to do here, but just for the record or for your notes, rewrite the now even power as sine squared of x raised to something. Like if this were the sine, if this were the sixth power of x, we'd rewrite it as the square cubed. If it were the eighth power of x, 
we'd rewrite it as the square to the fourth. But here we already have the square by itself, the square to the first. So there is no need for us to do that. Then three, use the Pythagorean identity to rewrite the square as the other trig function. So the sine squared plus the cosine squared equals one. So in this case, it's the sine squared that's this even power. The sine squared is one minus the cosine squared. And we are integrating one minus the cosine squared times the sine times the cosine squared. Let's see, four isn't going to come up but I'll put it on the board again for completeness. I should say it's not coming up in this problem, certainly might come up on the test. So here, if we had to do a step two, like if we'd ended up with the sine squared cubed, then after we did step three, we'd wind up with one minus the cosine squared cubed, and then we'd have to factor that out or I foil it out, I distribute. I never quite know what to say when we're not foiling because it's a higher power, but we need to, to multiply this. Um, again, that's, that's not coming up in this particular example because we didn't have to do step two. Five. U substitution. So you let U be the um, trig function that you haven't been messing around with. So in this case, we let U be the cosine. Well, let me copy this. What power was the cosine being raised to? Two. Thank you. So we let U be the function we haven't been messing around with. 
the point of the very first step, the point of that pulling out step, was to make sure that we have what we'll need when we do this few substitution. Um, we don't quite have a negative, but, but that's not an issue. We can throw in a negative as long as we throw in another negative to balance it out. And we get negative one minus u squared times u squared du. A negative is like a negative one. You can pull it out of an integral if you want to. u squared minus u to the fourth. Right, we're just distributing that multiplication. Then one third u cubed minus one fifth u to the fifth. Let's not forget constants of integration and Finally, um, we, I should not have, when I wrote down the U substitution, the U does not exceed the DX. Um, so negative one third cosine cubed plus, these negative signs make up plus one fifth, the cosine to the fifth of x plus c. So anything else that people would particularly like to see gone over? And I am um, so that you can have the 75 minutes. We are doing the test Tuesday, so I'll be lecturing on Monday. But if you do have last minute questions um, as you study over the weekend, I'll be I'll be happy to take those. But if there are no immediate questions, then I guess class is dismissed. I will see you Monday. Yeah.